you. Hey, everybody. All right, so thank you for joining us today, Jamie. Thank you so much. Lovely it's to exciting. see you here at Dice. Yeah, Thanks it's to my first time. In the audience, well, welcome. It's a lovely crowd. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about the shape of new realities, specifically the future. There we go. So what I wanted to talk to you guys about today was um, what the future of reality could be, but specifically, take a look backwards a little bit and think about how we used to think of what the future would be like when we imagined what it would be to be impacted by machines and technology. And specifically, to think about what we imagined the world would be like when VR and AR technologies changed our lives. Before we understood what it meant to do 3D rendering for real, before we had the technology, when we were exploring the concept of data and systems and files, and inside the machine, the reality that we were creating. What would it mean when machines became intelligent? What would it mean when they were smart enough to reach out and touch us? And you know, looking over the images that we have available in this space, it's a little creepy, this future, you know? In some cases, it seems to represent our fears about what it means to use the machine to look inside to our inner world but also perhaps a future which is a dystopian one in which machines have taken over, technology is everywhere, it's grim and overpopulated like Blade Runner, and you know, it's just kind of creepy. But there's always been this promise of a mind-expanding future in which we can do something else, where there's a depth of feel. These illustrations are from Kidmograph, it's amazing Tumblr, I'm a big fan. And they take a look at what the future seemed to look like before with an eye going on right now. A way in which we can experience sight and sound and motion in a way that perhaps revolutionizes the way that we experience ourselves, right? That's the promise of a new reality. But when you look back at the cyber future, I'm gonna have to say, Jerry, I find it a little bit strange, specifically because it seems to be filled with mostly glowing, partially nude women who are artfully posed in kitchens of the future, <laughs> um, where space and time seem distorted in a way that may or may not be good. It's kind of unclear in a lot of these images. And the familiar becomes unfamiliar to us. In a way, it's like the future is almost strangely real. And when you look at this imagery, you have to ask yourself, is this the future that we want to see in alternate reality, in expanded reality, or blended reality? Do we really want to take the stuff that we're really good at and put it in this space and make it more intense, like more real? Is that what we really want to do? That seems a little bit scary to me. So the other thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about today is this other fear that comes from the idea of a machine mind or a machine future. I'm an AI nerd, as many of you know. Are we marching blindly forward into a future filled with masses of people that are sort of controlled by a overlord, a polygonal godhead that's telling them what to think? I think you guys have all seen the photo that's been circulating on the internet, you know? Pfizer, slurpy drink, ready to spend the rest of my life sitting here. Is that what we're moving forward to? Or are we actually gonna use this medium to sort of reevaluate who we are as human beings? I mean, that's kind of exciting. Maybe what we're gonna do with this medium is reimagine ourselves in ways that uh, allow us to be more complex as people, more than just our gender or our social structure or our experiences as people, but something new. Maybe what we can do is reimagine concepts like beauty and think through what it means to be human in a whole new way. That seems to me like an amazing future and one that I definitely want to participate in. So we're pretty good at making creative worlds that we can explore as people. Like, you know, our industry is good at building space marine stuff. It's, we're good at giving you the fiction of being able to control places. But what if we start to imagine time and space differently? What if we really start to push the boundaries of what reality means as a creative space? 
or use it to imagine future utopias and build tools that let people, like Minecraft, build worlds and reimagine what a world could be like? Who will experience this world and how will they experience it? Will it be together or alone? What's on the horizon for VR and AR, for future realities? And what are we looking for as people? What are we trying to see in that future? So I decided to ask my friends to prepare for this conversation with Jerry. On Facebook, I just posted a question. I said, you know, if you could have any experience you wanted, what would it be? And these are some of the experiences that people wanted to have. They were pretty amazing, and I'm not going to show you pictures of them. You're just going to see the text. So my friend Kat said that she would like to be non-human, possibly a bird. I think we've all had that fantasy. My friend Lydia, who works at Oculus, would like to step into someone else's shoes for a day. I think that's a really good one. Build some empathy with people. Elizabeth Olson, who is here, imagined a game that would help people control pain by being able to visualize battles within their own body. Endless doors for my friend Wolfgang. I like this idea a lot. My friend Carol Shaw actually said that she would like to use VR or AR technologies to become good at something that she's not already good at, and she's good at a lot of stuff, so. I don't know if we'd want her to perform brain surgery on us after using her technology, but maybe. Kim McGolf, maybe playing with yourself as a child rendered from photos. Navigating an Escher staircase. Having a conversation with my mom, now deceased, that's from Brenda Romero. My friend Jeanette imagines a future in which she can swim with dolphins, but not necessarily be a dolphin, because then she can go up into a cloud. This one comes up a lot, I'm not gonna lie. It's capable, this technology is capable of this thing. But these are really interesting to me from Brenda Laurel. What about experiencing time from within the master of a Tai Chi body, or looking at geologic time? That's some really awesome stuff. Experiencing the force of a hurricane. This is Jim Whitehead, a friend of mine from UC Santa Cruz. Or really looking at history from the eye of the history itself, walking the earth as a Native American, playing a Mayan ball game. Could we use it to build skills that we don't already have as people? Like dealing with the death of people that eventually will happen. This is from my friend Kian, who's cresting 17. <laughs> Everyone has these really intense and emotional creative answers. I still think that we should make a dragon riding simulator because that would be too sick for words. <laughs> so obviously, you know, we're good at doing this stuff. And what I'm gonna talk to Jerry about now is are we there yet? Are we there yet? What can we expect? So how far away is this future? I don't know if I wanna be part of this dystopian future. <laughs> It's, this vision uh, of it's reality. It's kind of creepy, but uh, <laughs> we are really on an inflection point right now I where agree. the technology is getting to the point where we can start to have some of these um, simulations. Um, whether we'll want to have them is up for debate. Um, it's going to take a lot of exploration. Personally, I think that our experiences are going to be far more subtle than what we see in the movies because, you know, what we really want as people is not as, like, like Oh my God, wow. So like in the intense. Movies. Yeah. yeah, so tell us a little bit about that. What is it that, why do we make everything seem so insanely futuristic when really the future kind of dribbles in and dribs and drabs? Where does that come from? It's been very interesting watching the VR revolution, the second one. Yeah. Um, in the 90s, we didn't have the technology to actually pull off um, uh, VR for just anyone out in the, you know, in the world. No, sadly, that have. power glove wasn't making it happen. <laughs> I liked my power glove. <laughs> but, um, you know, now with cell phone technologies and sensors and displays of, you know, sufficiently high resolution, we can actually do it for, you know, several hundred dollars and anyone can do it. So, so now there's a lot it. of exploration um, going on. Hobbyists and enthusiasts um, are taking these and exploring some of these things. You know, is the data glove a better idea now that we have VR? You know, people are trying that. You know, so I think one of the other things what I, what I, think about is, you know, how, how wild will it get? So if the future is really happening now, and this is the push, this is the wave, and my dream of being able to build virtual reality stuff is going to come true, what are the potential applications? People talk a lot about verticals and the ways it can be applied to different business models. What do you see in that future? 
And we struggle with that every day, trying to figure out what the killer app is and the yeah. vertical that we're going to go to. Um, the thing is, we don't know yet. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of verticals, like education, which are, is fabulous. I just did a demo recently of a welding simulator with a, a welding gun that actually vibrated. And I did a, a simulated weld in this, this helmet. And when I was done, I flipped the helmet up to look at the weld. <laughs> like, everyone that does welding, it was that good that I, I wanted to inspect my So you my really weld. felt like you were there doing it. Yeah, so education will drive it. Of course, games are going to drive it. That's where you can explore some of these crazy, wild things. Like, you know, I really want to have League of Legends on my coffee table where me and my buddies can be sitting there and I can just lean in and, and look at all my game characters running wow. around. Maybe just spectate or, or participate with my wand, dropping health packs in. To Who doesn't want to do that? <laughs> and it's here. I mean, it's, that technology can ship within the next year or two. That is so amazing. So we're really seeing the opportunity happen for real in real space and real living rooms in real time with real hardware. I don't have to spend a bajillion dollars to get a machine to run it. But we have to get over some relatability issues. Explain those to me. Like a lot of VR rigs are, are ski mask type experiences. You yeah. kind of look goofy when you wear them. It's very isolating. It's not social. I can't point to my character on the, the coffee table if I have the mask on. My but buddies aren't going to see that. So form factors and weight and ease of use, eye comfort, all these things have to be addressed and, and worked on before someone like my father is going to go out and, and buy a headset and play his fantasy football. You know, I think about that a lot. I, uh, I'm sort of a fan of the enclosed, quiet experience that you can have with VR um, and have been working a little bit with Oculus and Story Studio on some of their stuff. And I'm really excited about that more meditative inward piece, maybe because I spend a lot of time being social and doing stuff like this. But I do also imagine that there will be this space for imagining a reality between multiple people that could be really great. This, like, maybe, like we were hearing in the last talk, creativity spaces, maybe, uh, you know, participatory gaming, like you're saying, where I'm in the headset and I'm closed off, but you're outside and you're helping me. That could be pretty rad. Well, you think back to the old days of LAN parties, you know, back in the 90s, we were thinking to ourselves, oh, the internet bandwidth will never be high enough that we can have good network gameplay, let alone yeah. talk to people, you know, over our, our headset in yeah. real time. You know, it took real visionaries to work on those first games. And it's the same for VR right now. So some of those things can be, um, uh, what do you say, socialized more, like yeah. adding microphones to these headsets, and you could be off you know, kind of a solitary experience, having this crazy, wild um, VR experience, but still social. Because I think we all long to have that social connection. And like network games, as soon as the internet got connected and low enough latency, then all of a sudden, first-person shooters took off like crazy, crazy because now it became, you know, more social and you had your f virtual friends out there. Yeah, I can remember being excited to lug my Xbox to someone's house and <laughs> bring a spare TV. <laughs> that seemed so revolutionary at the time. So, you know, for enthusiasts and dreamers like me who've always looked forward to the Blade Runner reality, no matter how dystopian, you know, I, I'm, I know that I'm sold. What, what do we do to get those people to be interested? Is it, is it a viral thing? You know, is it great marketplaces? What do you see as the sort of next step for getting over the sort of weird factor and getting into the public domain? Well, some of the viral things are great. We all remember the Oculus demo where um, grandma puts on the, the mm -hmm. headset and she's like going crazy. But those are, you know, these experiences that are just like incredible and like, wah, you know, or like 10 minute things. And I don't think she went out and bought an Oculus headset at that point. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's got to be a combination of social. It's got to be a, a combination of form factor and ease of use. Like, you know, it's, it's pretty difficult right now to uh, configure a VR headset. So we've got yeah, to get all those it. barriers, zero friction. Zero uh, friction. Well, so in a way, if you think about it, like some of the challenges that we had with a game like Journey, for example, where you're trying to sort of reduce the amount of UI and get people into the experience and take away some of the fear of online games, give them a safe space to play. And it's a similar challenge. So in a way, maybe as we design what the future of VR is as business owners and as funders and publishers, what we need to do is take ourselves out of that box and think a little bit more about how we can reduce those barriers. That's yeah, an interesting perspective. Uh, when I was working at Valve R&D, 
we thought first-person shooter on VR was going to be the killer app, but it turned out it made everyone sick within like minutes. So yeah. um, we had to reset our, our thoughts of, well, maybe it is tabletop experiences. Maybe it's more stationary. Maybe it's you know where you have to actually move through the room. And uh, you know we were getting better results at that point. Um, I think Microsoft put it very well in their Hololens so uh, announcement when they said you can keep your eye on the world as well as have the VR experience. So I think that's what people are going to long for in their experience, a blending of, of not, both. Of both. Yeah, so maybe um, I've had some conversations even here with people about this, this idea that there'll be a fear of missing out if you're shut in. And so how can we kind of take away that fear or give you permission to feel that way? I don't mind shutting people out on an airplane, I have to tell you. Well, one of our favorite right. things to do in the Valve hardware lab was take canned air and squirt people when they had the <laughs> VR rig on. So, you know, you do that once Aww. and then everyone becomes super paranoid. You know, <laughs> That's mean. <laughs> I we, think we we've can't all deploy. Yeah, we can't deploy yeah. that kind of experience into the home. But no. there are things on the horizon, like our technology, you, can put, you see the world, it just blends it into the world. Um, some of the bigger companies are working on, on blended experiences. So you can choose, you know, how what's, much. Yeah, how much, and you can be out of it in a second. I like this idea. Do you think that consumers really want to have just one kind of experience with this technology? Like, I think of, you know, I'm going to go to the... I'm going to go into the living room and I'm going to play my game, or I'm going to go into the living room and I'm going to watch Down and Abbey. You know, <laughs> you know, what are the, what are the, is is there a range of experiences that an individual customer will want to have? Like, it's these are the sorts of questions I always ask myself when I'm looking at a new technology. Is it multi-purpose, single-purpose? You know, how do you feel about that? Well, I think we all want our our ponies, our pink ponies. But <laughs> um, yeah, I think there is going to be. Um, certain groups that are going to want that really immersive experience. And maybe the same headsets can do that, or the same you know, magical plasma display device mm. can do that. But um, I think the ability for the user to select is going to be critical of how deeply they're going to go into this. And no, you know, we may not actually want to have game content that is photorealistic. Like, I'm not sure I want yeah. to be driving down the road and have a hacker take over my AR um, windshield and throw a, a body out in front of me when I'm driving, right? So, Scary. You, know, you know, perhaps it's going to be more cartoony and it's very obvious that it's a, uh, a synthetic, you know, blended part of our world. You know, I've had the experience in multiple headsets and like with technologies already where it was pretty clear to me that it wasn't real and yet my body was reacting it in yeah. a visceral way. So I don't think it needs to look real. It just needs to feel real. Feel yeah, depth, the, depth of feel. The right? first time in the hardware lab when we put a like a platform and it was like a cliff down, none of us wanted to step off of it, and <laughs> it was very primitive. And, I've but to have that had depth that experience. and it incites that feeling, it was great. So crazy. Was well, there anything else that you want to add now that we've had this conversation? Things that you want to tell the audience here and out there in the virtual space? Well, this type of experience is going to be ubiquitous in the next four to five years for sure. It's going gonna, it's gonna to start um, propagating out there. We see all the, the major companies researching it. Um, there's products that are going to be consumer friendly. I'm a little biased towards ours, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, it's, it's going to happen. The and future is now, is yes. what you're saying. It's definitely yes. happening. Well, that's exciting for me as a developer, but also as a gamer and as someone who could use a little time to meditate and take, it, take, take a little bit of time out of this reality. So I think that's all we have time for today. So we wanted to say thank you to everyone who tuned in, wherever you are, and that we'll see you in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much.